Hello and welcome. My name is Benoit Paliquet, and I'm one of the portfolio managers and the founder of Exponent Investment Management. We're going to cover today our Q1 or first quarter 2020 quarterly review. It's obviously been a very historic quarter, very important quarter. And so we decided to do a video as well as the, the our usual written report. How this report, uh, video report is laid out, we're going to go from the more broad uh, big picture items towards the more granular, more detailed views. So you'll be able to pause or simply exit the video if you uh, are not interested in watching the more uh, complicated or granular uh, aspects of our quarterly review. Thank you so much and let's get started. There are three key drivers to this quarter's performance, market performance. The first one obviously is COVID-19. We're not gonna talk about the science the public health issues or anything around that. We're really just going to take a look at, take a look at COVID-19 and its impact on the economy and the markets. So global health pandemic, we all know this by now, and life as we know it has come, has been put on hold. Effectively, a large part of the economy, anything that is consumer driven, anything that has to do with person to person interaction has been suspended. Uh, for the foreseeable future. It's the global pandemic as well, and the investor reaction has been, until February, somewhat muted. Here in North America, we were you know, watching the events unfold in Asia and then eventually in Europe uh, and in the Middle East, but really the thought process for, for North American investors was that this will have an impact on global growth. It will have an impact on um, the supply chain, but the the concept of a pandemic coming to our shores was not within um, the common narrative. February happened, but we're real around the, the top of the markets, if you will, was uh, mid February nineteenth or February twentieth, twentieth here in Canada, and from there there was a fast, historic in terms of speed and deep market uh, drop. From top to bottom, you're looking at mid 30s in terms of all markets. Market technicals, we had many investors because we were at the end of a, of a bull market, many investors were investing using leverage. So leverage is when you take um, an equity and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but effectively when you have a long run in equity prices and all asset prices going up, people will take, will wanna Im improve their returns, improve, or um, augment their returns, and so they will borrow to invest. When markets drop, very often that leverage needs is the is the first to go. In other words, the lenders want to protect their own assets and therefore the loans, and so will force investors to sell. And we saw that in um, really late February, and it accelerated through March through the bottom of uh, March twenty third. So COVID-19 was an interesting evolution, if you will. So what I've done here is I've laid out some headlines going back to November. And I just wanted to, so, so many clients and many um, you know, friends of the firm are asking me, well, how do we get here? How come no one saw this coming? Where were, where were the, the public health officials? Were they asleep at the switch? Now, it's important to remember that there are very often there's these bugs that come out and they die off or, or certain things are, are implemented that, that prevents a pandemic. And this one was a little different. So I want to go back to late last year where, you know, the headlines, I mean, I, I, I took these headlines from the, the Globe and Mail here. And so from various news sources reprinted at, at the Globe and Mail. Um, you know, the WHO is talking about a, another case of bubonic plague in, in China, um, the measles in 2018. So SARS is not on the record late 2018. In early 2020, there starts to be a talk about a pneumonia outbreak, part of a new virus. And so early January is when in China, there starts to be um, some chatter around what we'll now know as, as COVID-19. A few weeks later, call it three weeks 
late January, WHO is preparing for the possibility of a wider coronavirus outbreak, and they start reaching out to hospitals worldwide. So we're in late January. This is not contained to China only, and, and the WHO is starting to think about the, how this will be a global um, issue. However, January 23rd, we're still having concerns. WHO, it's, it's still, Wuhan is, is something serious, but it's not a global health issue. And then late February, there's a bit of a lull, and then we start seeing coronaviruses fall in China. But then the narrative around the global spread starts increasing. Here in Canada, WHO officials, the Canadian officials are saying it's still you know, within the realm of control. And really when we get to late March is really when the pandemic declaration comes out and the epicenter will be the US as, as, as we now know today. Now, as investors, I remember in 2001, during the um, September 11th, the terrorist attack, after there was a normal reaction for every investor, every talking head on the news channels to become an expert in Arab studies. In 2007, 2000, or I should say 2008, 2009, there was another series of experts, quote unquote, who always come out and they were you know, experts in forensic accounting or mortgage business or the the overall banking regulators. And as people were trying to understand what had happened, they were, many investors were turning themselves and, and trying to be experts. So we will not be doing that here. We will want to make a word of caution, however, that everyone with nowadays, anyone with a YouTube channel is, can be called an expert. So be very careful in terms of the, the information that's out there. It would be our opinion to, to stick with the government mandated um, you know, whether it's the WHO, the CDC, the Canadian government, the different provincial levels of governments here in Canada, you want to go and with the information that is from credible sources. Uh, we all want to inform ourselves, but make sure that you're using the information that stems from credible sources. The situation is fluid. As we saw from the headlines, things do change. And the market, you can see investor reactions is since, you know, as I'm writing this on April 7th, as I'm recording this on April 6th and 7th, the markets are on fire. We're seeing, you know, 10% return. The markets are currently in a rally and we'll cover what that means a little later in the video. And so it's very important to keep your wits about you and sort of understand what the, what the factors are. So remember about these experts, even a stop clock is right twice a day. I love that saying. Many people, including myself, sort of look back and say, why didn't we see this coming? And then we we read or, or listen to so-called experts that go online and or online or on the news channels, and they'll say, well, you know, I predicted this back in January and so on and so forth. It's difficult to, um, to believe, especially when you look at the long-term aspects or the long-term performance aspects of these so-called experts. So if someone calls for a pandemic every year for 20 years, eventually they get it right. If everyone calls for a bear market, every year, eventually they've done it right. So just remember when you're looking back and, and, and seeing if, you, if we can learn something, try to not necessarily um, heed advice from, from so-called experts that are right um, just a few times in a decade. So what is this COVID-19 all about? We're really, what we're trying to do is we're not trying to get ahead of this pandemic in terms of the disease itself, what we're trying to do is what's called flatten the curve. We've all heard that. We all are forced to stay home, social distancing. But what we're trying to do is protect the health system, which is quite fragile. If we all show up at the emergency room at the same time, this system becomes overwhelmed. But also there are secondary factors. You know, what about our, our logistics, um, our food supply, our health and safety? All of these quite fragile part of our everyday life should those parts be um, taken in or, or hit seriously by the pandemic, then you could see other problems, other secondary and tertiary problems arise. So really this whole social distancing aspect, which we know works, is really to try and to protect the system that we have. 
So let's look at the performance. The performance is absolutely horrendous. Let's let's just not what it. Let's call it for what it is. We have on the right. We have our uh, our usual table. So the, this is all in Canadian dollar terms. First quarter minus twenty one percent for the S and P minus uh, the sorry the TSX minus twenty one. The S and P five hundred is down thirteen percent. But remember that's in Canadian dollar terms, where the U S dollar appreciated eight percent. So really, it's a, a similar number minus twenties. The NASDAQ, again, close to minus 15 to 20. The Dow Jones in Europe, that's down as well. The emerging markets getting crushed. Really, the only thing that's up is the US dollar, and we have our um, bond market here in Canada, which is up slightly. So the S&P 500 is down 34% in 23 days. Absolutely historical. The TSX is down 37 in even less days, one day less. So we really have to call it for what it is. We are in a bear market. And the rules will change in terms of how you manage a bear market. And we're going to go through that a little later. We're actually going to cover later in the video the history of bear markets. They all more or less behave the same. It's interesting. They all have their own um, cycles or life to them. The causes are different, but how one can manage them, uh, you can look back in history and garner some interesting information. Again, in the first downdraft of bear market, all correlation goes to one. So all markets, all asset classes basically go down in unison. Part of that is the forced selling that I mentioned earlier, a lot of leverage being used and people needing to, to, to leave the market or liquidate their positions um, to pay back their loans. What you want to do in a bear market since correlation is go to one. So all the stocks that you've wanted to own as a portfolio manager or as an investor and were either too expensive or you simply didn't have any room in your portfolio, now you get a chance to upgrade and buy these assets. Um, remember, no, there's no set clock in terms of bear market. We all know they end, but some of them are very short. Others are quite much more prolonged in terms of time. So you really have to be open-minded about the length of time of the bear market. And you really have to look at the data. The data, you really, the data has to drive your decision-making. In our case, we believe that this is a pandemic, this is a public health issue. And so we're watching the, the, the data around that to give us clues around the impact of the social distancing, how long it will last, who will be covered, how it will be unwound, if you will, and the impact on the economy. Have price targets around the assets you wanna buy, and those price targets may or may not come to fruition. Might mean they might be too low, the stock never hits what you wanna do. So really you wanna be data driven and watch the market. And also when you wanna wanna lay over time. So you wanna have a budget around your price targets, but also have a budget around how long you think you wanna to take to deploy your capital. Because you might be right on your timing and wrong on your pricing. It's, it's really critical that you understand that there's really, it's sort of a matrix and it's got time on one, uh, on one axis and prices on the other. So we talked a little bit about leverage. Leverage is very important. So I'm gonna talk about two strategies that have been used that I think had a big impact on what happened in uh, late March in terms of the speed of uh, the sell-off. So leverage is defined as borrowing all assets to invest. So what you will do is, let's just say you have been investing since, since 2010, uh, the beginning of this bull market was 2009. And let's just say you put half a million dollars and that half million dollars turned into one and a half million dollars. You would be then allowed, uh, your, your brokerage house would loan you uh, up to 70% of that value to deploy into the market. So as markets go up, many investors will layer in and actually borrow from their assets to deploy into the markets. And no one calls the whistle at the top of the market. And so when those positions, those lever positions to be unwound, they, everyone hits for the exit at the same time. So that's private investors and some institutional investors, but also there's products that were developed over the past 12 years or so, 10 years around um, selling an asset called the VIX or the volatility, which is a tradable um, security. And so what people would do is would they sell the VIX and then turn around and buy the underlying markets. So as markets were calmer, people would slow down and they would buy, uh, or sorry, sell the VIX. That would create capital for them that, that they could then redeploy. 
a version of that, and it's in another article in the Wall Street Journal. It's a very good article. I think it's, I'm not sure if it's still behind the paywall it was when it first came out. Uh, same thing with the Barron's article, which was a while back. This was dated um, back in August of 2019. And it's really around how people are using VIX uh, as an asset class. The article from the Wall Street Journal is interesting because it, it, it layers in the idea of um, creating products which are sold to Asian investors, promising those investors a steady stream of income. The money is then garnered and then redeployed and using leverage, then um, redeployed into the markets. And so, and when the markets sell off, the, the asset or the strategy triggers these sales. And so there's forced selling. You'll see in the article that the number of dollars raised through those um, notes in Asia are astronomical. And they've been going on for a better part of a decade. And so obviously when these strategies don't work anymore and they're facing steep losses, everyone sells at the same time. So the equity that forms the basis of the loan really defines the stability. So if the equity is something as volatile as the VIX, Obviously, if the VIX were to go up and you're short, you need to you need to cover. And in order to cover, you need to sell your underlying assets. And so it's a, it's a, it's effectively a a levered unwinding, if you will. The long bull markets we had bull markets and bond market, the stocks, real estate, everything. So a lot of people sort of were complacent around risk. And really, look, investing is about two things: fear and greed. And so people were high on the greed scale making this strategy appealing. International investors, so because the US markets was doing so well, um, and global markets in, by and large, but the US market and the US dollar is going up, for investors, international investors, the strategy of, of effectively borrowing in Asia and then redeploying the capital in the US was very attractive. So let's look at the bear market rules. So how we do it here, we really realize we analyze the market data and the portfolio data and look at what you own. Remember, you're trying to upgrade. So you want to figure out who will make it, what types of liquidity they need. So we realize we're in a bear market. You then, um, let me get to my little scribbly note here. You go from the bear markets and then you, as markets rally, because you get always, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but you tend to get these big rallies so you can get liquid and start selling the assets that you may not want to own and set targets on your buys, both in terms of dollars and time, and then execute when your prices or your calendar days um, appear before you. And then go back and re reanalyze what you're, what, you're, you're, what you're trying to do, what you have been doing, and what is the new data, information, what kind of new information you're getting. What you don't wanna do in a, in, as opposed to a bull market when really buying the dips is the strategy. And so, any downturn is something that should be taken advantage of. In a bear market, things are a little different. You want to be data-driven. You want to understand why is the market selling off or why is the market appreciate, appreciating or going up. And these violence, these, mo these moves in the markets are quite violent. So emotions can take over. And so you really want to make sure that you're data-driven in your uh, investment plan. So sideways markets are defined as, as uh, you know, buying the dips or periodic rebalancing away from strong sectors to weak sectors. That can, it works very well in the bull market. In a bear market, you're trying to upgrade your portfolio because really you, you have an idea what, how long you think it will last, but you really don't know. Um, you want to focus on your own personal liquidity. You want to make sure that you are liquid, that you don't have to sell in order to live your life in this, you don't want to sell in, in sort of down markets. You want to make sure that the companies that you're looking at are, are liquid. They don't need to do a bond raise. They don't need to do an equity raise and raise to, in order to continue to operate or to grow. So you, so you might be looking at companies that are growing not as quickly, but are much more solid financially. Remember, be data driven and keep an open mind. I can't stress this enough. And the goal here is to mitigate the damage on the downside and really to, to prepare for the bounce back. You really wanna be able to do that. The, 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 the notion of, of hunkering down and doing nothing will work over time, especially if your products, you don't have much of a choice. If you want a mutual fund or an exchange traded funds, uh, you don't have a lot of levers to pull, but if you own stocks directly, you can do this 
upgrade the strategy and really trying to prepare yourself for the bounce back. Remember, bar markets, bear markets always end. And take your time and don't be a hero. It's very important. Meaning, what do I mean by being a hero? No one's going to catch the bottom. And no one's going to get out of a rally at the top. You really want to massage your situation for what you're trying to achieve. If, if the goal is to upgrade your portfolio, then really you want to take advantage of uh, those rallies. And when there's a sell-off, don't panic, actually start buying. But you will never pick the bottom. So really just try to do it methodically. So the current situation, COVID-19, what do we know about it? Well, the R0 is two to two and a half, which is actually quite high, meaning one person will spread it to two to two and a half people. So that makes it a problem. The other problem is a long incubation, which means that you can have these super spreaders, people walking around with no symptoms, they're not staying home, and but they, they're spreading the virus. And that's a bit of a problem. And that's why you're getting sort of these fast exponential growth in terms of cases. You also have high hospitalization rate, which is really what we're trying to defer here. What we're trying to do by this social distancing is we're trying to prevent everyone from showing up at the emergency room at the same time and overwhelming the system. There's no vaccine. There's no real developed pharmaceutical treatment protocols for this. So what we do know works is social distancing. It's the only proven mitigator and it's worked time and time again. The battlefront really, as I said earlier, is the health system, but also the supply chain. So think of our economy as a series of pipes. And so anything that is front um, facing, you know, client facing. So think of obviously retail, restaurants, but also healthcare providers, uh, dentists, uh, chiropractors, all sorts of professionals that are dealing with us on a daily basis, they have had, they've needed to shut down completely. Um, and so that has an impact, obviously, on their landlord. It has an impact on foot traffic, retail traffic. It has an impact on banking, on loans, on car sales. All of the, uh, the our economy is, is basically a series of pressurized pipes that are interconnected. And really, the casualty in order to get ahead of this COVID-19 has been the consumer economy. That, in the end, is what really is trying to do. The good news, just like the bear market, is social distancing does end. We, we have a pretty good idea in terms of the model of how long it will take. Now, each jurisdiction is different. Each case is different. So I will not say how long I think will last. It's really on a case-by-case -case basis. It's not my lane. Um, my lane is just to talk about the markets. So how do you, how do you manage? How do you navigate a bear market? Well, we're from Canada, as most of you or all of you know, uh, for existing clients and friends of the firm. When you're driving the snowstorm, your whole idea of how well you're traveling, your speed, your mileage, your fuel consumption, how quickly you're getting uh, to destination, they don't matter. All that you're trying to do is to get home in one piece. You slow down, you look for markers, you really sort of... Um, you become much more aware of what's going on around you. It's the same thing in a bear market. The goal in a snowstorm is to get home safely. In bear markets, you wanna know your history. So have you been through a bear market before? Are you just, have you just retired? Or is this the fourth bear market and you, you, you've done this before and this is as bad as it gets. So really, if this is your first bear market, this really can't get worse. If it's your fourth one, and unfortunately, you know, they happen every 10 or 12 years. So we kind of tend to forget, um, present company included. So we have to go back in time and sort of know your history of what's happened, what's transpired. And we're going to go through that a little bit later. Know your bias as well. If you're a positive person, you will tend to data mine and look for things that say, oh, it's not a big deal. If you're a negative person or you're always a glass half empty type of person, you also will do the opposite. Look for data points to confirm your bias. Make sure that you understand your bias. And as you're reading or knowing more, make sure that you're, you're reading sources that are opposite of your bias. Be data driven, make sure that you're liquid. Uh, really view bear markets as opportunities. They are temporary. And that's really at the end of the day, what you're trying to do in a bear market. You're trying to get to the other side. Talk about the definition of a bear market. Well, price declines, check. 
Uh, typically, prices fall 20% or more. Check. Widespread pessimism and negative investor, negative investor sentiment. We've had that. Uh, bear markets usually accompany general economic downturns. Well, check that. We've had to shut down the economy. So really, we are in a bear market. We can't. We, we are in a recession. There is no arguing those three points. So let's look at past bear markets. Past bear markets. So I, I, we looked, I looked back and went back in time and looked at past bear markets to understand if the VIX, the VIX, sorry, the volatility measure could help us try to pinpoint a bottom. In other words, when the VIX is at its highest, are the markets at their lowest? And, and also I wanted to understand the stages of the bear market. There's an initial fall, a rally, well, a relief rally, bear trap, they all have these different names. And then finally a retest. Now the retest doesn't mean you go back to your initial low. We'll see in history, you went back somewhat towards it. Sometimes you get well past it. It all depends on uh, each situation is different. Hence my, if you get anything out of this video is be open-minded and be uh, flexible in your thought process and be data-driven. Bit of a history lesson. Went back to 87 and looked at the uh, crash of 87. So the markets peaked in September of 87. We all well, have heard of it. I was actually around, but not in the business, that in October of 87, the market dropped significantly, quite quickly. And then you could see a few rallies and then another retest. And then finally we're on our way. So that's first instance of a bear market combined with rallies, and combined with a retest. So from high to low, the market in 87 went down 35% on that Monday. One day, 35%. So let's look at the rallies a little bit. So it's the same chart, but just we focused in on the fall of 87. So we have our fall here from early October, and then we see a few rallies, one, two, over a few days, three, four, and then it eventually fades, and then there's acceleration in terms of selling. That's very important. Most people think that it's, you know, bear markets are a V. They're not. They kind of go down and then they grind their way. And so if you stop and think about it, that was the low, but really, if you were a buyer around 240 points on the S&P, you would have done well. You were roughly 10% off the bottom. And you had, effectively several months. I didn't even go up to 250, really. So think about it from an investor's perspective. You don't want to be a hero and wait out these lows. You'll never get them. And trading these rallies, very difficult to do. Really, the idea is to get liquid, upgrade, find the things that you want to own. In around 250, 260, 240 to 260, that is um, a good, you know, a good exercise. Rallies, 20%. We had a retest. So from the top down to here it was another 20% drop. And those rallies and retests are really, I will say from experience, is what drive investors nuts. So if you're in cash and the market's rallying, it's very difficult. So you have this greed factor comes in. There's a name for it, fear of missing out. And then there's retests. So when markets are going down, you never have enough cash. And so that's always the frustrating label. So really going back to having your buy list, your liquidity setup, and then your deployment strategy is really the only way to stay sane and actually take advantage of the opportunity. I have another market here for you, 1999 bear market. So this is basically the, the end of, uh, there's a few underwhelming or um, undercurrents in there. I'll, I'll skip them, but basically safe to say the market peaked at 1191 say and dropped twice first in september then in october and the market drop was quite substantial we have 1191 down to call it 950. so we have a more than 20 percent drop we have another rally and then we have the retest and then we have a bounce back that is quite quite quick and quite violent so again you're trying to your entry points are somewhere around those three levels. So call it 975 to 1050. If you were able to go in there, you know, 10, 15% off the bottom, you probably would have done quite well. Obviously the markets are significantly higher than that today. 
If we move over to the VIX, we can see that the markets really bottom in September and October, and we see a peak in September and again in October. So in this instance, we did have peak in VIX, bottom in the markets. Um, but the markets did, you know, the VIX did drop basically by half a few times and you still had the opportunity to buy. So, I mean, in November or late October, you were around here in the VIX and you could still purchase right around these levels, even around these levels as well, where the VIX is back to the, the normal trading range. So the VIX is a clue, is an indicator, but it's not a foolproof system, you know, step into the market when the VIX is at its peak, uh, as I'll show you a little later. This is 2001, so obviously the, the tragedy of September 11th, we have a more protract, protracted or longer bear market. So really we're moving from August of 2000 to September of 2001. So it's a good 13 months, um, 12, 13 months in terms of the bear market. We still have some, you know, not insignificant rallies, but the trend is clearly down. We have our first bottom right down here. The market is oversold. That's our relative strength index. And then if we look over at the uh, April lows, April of 2001, um, we have our first low and the VIX is 34. And obviously the twin tires going down, market absolutely selling off. But I would argue we were already in a downtrend. And so the bear market, the event, the final event, the retest, if you will, was uh, the Twin Towers. So again, bear market, we have one rally and then a retest. The VIX here spiked up in September, obviously, at 44. Um, again, oversold positions, overbought positions in terms of the VIX. More recent history, we move over into 2008 and 2009. So we have the S&P 500 still. We're looking at our initial drop down here, a bit of a rally, and then a new low. So we, the, the peak obviously of the market, one could argue was the summer, late spring of 2008. I remember like it was yesterday, Labor Day of 2008 is when really the market started, started dropping quickly. And then there was a few rallies and a few drops, but the trend was down. And then there was a counter rally, bear trap rally, call it whatever you want, and then another down leg. So again, on an entry point, where could you have been? Well, somewhere, I don't think anyone would have picked the bottom here of 700, 666 to be exact. But, you know, history is any guide, anywhere between 800 and 900, you would end up quite well. So again, don't be a hero. Don't try to pick the bottom because if you miss this bottom and waiting for a third one and the market runs away from you, have a strategy around it and be data-driven. Again, the RSI is oversold. At the bottom, it's also oversold during this period. The VIX peaks in November down here. But for our March lows, the VIX is still quite elevated around 50, but has, is not at the other elevated lows. Or, uh, the VIX is not at the highest peak as opposed to um, the market being at its lowest lows. So it's interesting here where the VIX was a clue for the first drop, but not the second. We can see the VIX overbought, but again, the VIX in March of 09 is quite fine. Now let's look at a present situation. We've got 2020 on the chart. We have the VIX on the right, the S&P 500 on the left. So I actually went further back and went back into 2018 because some investors are actually calling for this to be the first drop and this the second drop. I disagree. I'll show you in a bit in a minute because when you're looking at bear markets, one of the telltale signs also is the credit markets. How are they behaving? So here we are, market peaks in February, 30, almost 3,400, and we dropped to 2,200. 34, 35% drop in 23 days, covered that. Right now we're in a rally. We're around, as I'm recording this, 
the Dow is 23,200, the S&P is above 2,700, so right about here. So that's a move about 20 percent plus. Is that normal in a bear market? Absolutely. Do you chase this mark here, the market here? Again, we don't have a crystal ball. So we can look at, we have one oversold position, okay? Um, some stocks are making or have made loose new lows last week and obviously October or um, during March of 23rd, that was low, everything was, was selling off. Are we gonna revisit those lows? I wonder, we're gonna talk a little bit later when we get into the granular of the markets in terms of the earnings expectations, what does that mean for the economy? The markets will follow, actually will try to lead the economy in trying to add, investors will try to figure out what the impact of social distancing, distancing will be on the overall economy. Safe to say here that we basically have one low and one rally. Whether we bounce from here, whether we settle down, it remains to be seen. So a lot of it depends on what happens from a medical perspective. The U.S. is still in lockdown. Florida locked down last week. Canada has been locked down for, let's call it, um, a few weeks, two or three weeks. And so a lot of it, we know that the disease, uh, in terms of its spread, slows down dramatically. In the three, four weeks, uh, we get some significant, significant improvements. So that's great from a human side and from a medical side, but really from the economy side, we don't know what the reopen will look like, how, when it will happen, and which sectors will be impacted and when. So remember the connected pipes, they're pressurized. When we take the pressure out of a few of those, and when we repressurize them, it'll be interesting to see, and really that's the crux of the problem, how will the economy behave? I mentioned why 2009, the sell-off was not a credit. It was not a bear market, in my opinion. Here we have December of 2019. This is the uh, bond market. We saw the market in Canada sell off and then rally. And the sell off was really the corporate bond market. The, the Canadian bond market actually rallied very hard in uh, March, late March, and then went back to its uh, usual levels. So there was a flight to, to, to safety for call it a week. Um, the overall market sold off in terms of the general bond market, and we'll see why in a minute. If we look at the lower end credits, so we have the lower end corporate bonds, and we see a pretty significant sell off here of almost 20%. In the preferred share market, similar type of sell off, uh, actually more exasperated, and we see uh, you know significant uh, oversold conditions. Um, back in 2019, credit was fine. Preferred markets were sold off a little bit, but they had sold off earlier than that due to uh, structures around the market. So really, in my mind, technically the sell-off in December, that ended in December 20 of 2019 was down 19%. So technically not a bear market. It was not associated with a recession and was not associated with, with difficult credit markets. So really in my mind, we're really looking the, the current downfall that we've received or, or, or witnessed um, is the first leg down. If we look at the U.S. credit markets, similar story. So we have the overall government bonds. We see, um, you know, late March, um, we see sort of a rally um, from February to March in terms of a flight to quality, and the market sort of settles back down to its original range. Same thing in terms of the higher yield market. In February, we see a significant, a significant sell-off again. And then we obviously with equity markets, we see the rally. So what does that mean? Well, we, we clearly are in a bear market. Credit markets are suffering, are reacting to it. Now we move into the more granular part of our quarterly report where we look at the market summaries. So if we look at the Canadian market, First, we'll look at the, it's important to understand that the market is really made up of three sectors dominated by the financials at almost a third of the weight. So financials are banks and insurance. The energy producers, uh, including the pipelines, make up another 13% of the index. 
I remember not so long ago when that when that sector comprised uh, another 28 to 30 percent of the index materials. So it's metals and minings and trees. So call it rocks and trees. And finally, another 12 percent with industrials, which is the production. So think Magna, think people putting or companies putting things together and the shipping of um, those products, but also of our raw materials. If we look at the Canadian market, whoops, if we look at the Canadian market from peak to trough, um, let me get my little squiggly thing here. So we've got um, the peak here in March, uh, sorry, uh, late February and the trough here in March of 23rd, 23rd of March and peak to trough, we have 30, 37.43%. And the, the time span here is 22 days. We all see the volume of shares traded in that time span um, close to two to three times. Um, so you're at five, 600 million of shares and the average number of shares traded is around 200 million. So what does that tell you? The high force volume, so you had a lot of force selling, a lot of people exiting the market all at once. Let's look at corporate profits for a minute. So the recent fall in economic activity uh, or recession is not reflected in consensus, consensus numbers really right now. Especially in Canada, we had the fall in oil price and it has, as we know, you know, 12 or 13% of the index. That hasn't bled through, if you will. But we do know that last year, the TSX earned something around $1,000. And so if you're trying to extrapolate what the market bottom looks like, you have to look at this number and then do you discount it by 3% or do you discount it by 10% and, and get a $900 a share number for next year? And then from there, you would apply a, a PE multiple. And we'll do that a little bit later and show you graphically what it looks like. But if you're at 1,000 and you, and you keep a 13 multiple, that gives you a TSX level of 13,000. To go back, um, remember that we bottomed at uh, 11,000, slightly above 11,000. So that gives you that the market, the investors really priced in a pretty significant drop in profit and or what they're willing to pay for a dollar of profit. So what we're looking for when we, when you're trying to, you're looking at the technicals of the market, but also you're trying to layer in some fundamentals to, to give you an idea of where you're sitting in terms of the prevailing winds as you deploy capital, you're trying to understand if you're uh, early, late, where you sit in in uh, in the cycle of the rebound, if you will. So really, in my mind, let's just say that the the economy is shut down for, let's call it six weeks, which is roughly 12 percent of the year. And so you could expect all else being equal, a twelve percent drop in uh, earnings growth. That assumes that the economy is not function, there's no sales being made at all during those, those, that six weeks of social distancing, which is not the case. Uh, really, the part of the economy that was shut down is the consumer facing. Um, so what does that mean? Well, in the worst case scenario, you take 12% off a thousand and that gives you $880 in terms of earnings. And then you can decide as an investor, what do you think the, the consensus will be on terms of applying a multiple to that? Is it 12 times, 13 times, 10 times? That gives you an idea of what time of what type of lows are we looking at. Um, so what do we mean by valuations? Well, uh, we saw that we bought them slightly, well, I call it 10,000 or 11,000, but it's closer to, to 12,000. Uh, right now, the market is above that. We have, as I said, a nice rally. Why the P-E ratio is so low at 12.81 currently is because the earnings have not bled through right now. We have the earnings here at 921. As I said, we don't have a full gamut of, um, of adjustments, but let's just say that we get somewhere around 900, 880 on the downside. And so you can apply some sort of multiple. You can see that historically the multiple was, call it, 16 or 17 times. So that will give you a good idea of where the markets should, should trade at, um, how they get there, how quickly they get there, do they retest though? That's really is, is really um, the crux of the enigma here. So the downside really can be defined technically and fundamentally. I think I've, I've covered that in Canada. Let's look at the market leadership. 
The market went down 20%, 21% for the quarter. We have a, key, a few of the tech darlings making uh, new highs, um, but the real sort of winners really were the sectors in terms of um, the slower movements in information technology, which Shopify makes uh, a, a big um, portion of, but really you're looking at consumer index, communications, so think cell phones, think uh, telecom and utilities. So those three sectors really did about half as bad. They still went down significantly, but they did not get crushed to the same extent as the energy sector or the consumer discretionary sector or the real estate sector. Even the banks, who most people you know view them as a sure thing, basically gave you slightly worse than market performance. So when I say that correlation goes to one in a down market, everything goes down. Aside from a few select stocks, um, and we happened in our portfolios to own a few of them that did go up, but at the end of the day, you don't own enough. It mitigates a bit of the damage, but everything goes to zero. So let's talk about oil. Canada is still an oil the economy is still, uh, the oil is still a very important part of the economy. So right now, during this market crisis, you had Russia and Saudi Arabia start fighting uh, for market share. What do they mean by that? They basically want to flood the market with oil. So that's great if you, you know, go up and fill up your car. We're, we're seeing oil or gasoline prices that we haven't seen, despite the higher taxes that we have on uh, liters of gasoline. We haven't seen these prices in three, four or five years. So at the end of the day, what you're trying to ascertain is if you have a, a pretty big portion of the economy that's shut down, no one's driving, everyone's confined to their homes, driving once a week, the manufacturing, China, in terms of manufacturing, that's turning much slower. A lot of you know European manufacturers are simply not manufacturing at all. So you have a lot less shipping. All of these things, all of these, economic situation due to the, the pandemic and the social distancing will have an impact on oil consumption. To what extent? No one really knows. What we do know is that Saudi Arabia and Russia are talking about reducing their consumption or their production by 10 million barrels a day. And the narrative is it won't be enough. I'll show you why that makes a lot of sense. So I have, I have the chart here of the oil price. It peaked uh, back in 2018, well above $70, and we're currently sitting at 20 at the price at the time of this chart, probably closer to $22, $25. Uh, the last bottom was back here, um, which was back in 2016, uh, which was around $30. And so we haven't seen these low prices in since really 2008, 2009. So the oil and gas sector is down hard. The question is, what's going to happen. So let's look, I have here the IEA, the, uh, let me get rid of this piece here for you. So will demand, will the 10 million barrels be enough? Well, the world on the, on the demand side has been around 99, 98, let's call it 100 million barrels per day for a while now. And on the production level, same level. So if we have a demand shock, in other words, this number becomes something else. Let's just say it becomes 80 million barrels. Well, that there's a we have a market that's oversupplied by 20 million barrels per day. That's a lot of a lot of barrels. There's actually storage constraints. So the Russians and the and the Saudis have to come to some sort of agreement. But overall, all oil producing countries, including Canada, is going to have, and, and the U.S. will have to reduce their production. And to what level? It remains to be seen. But let's agree that the demand is not 100 million, uh, not 100 million barrels per day, but it's something closer to, let's call it 85. If we use the same metric of 12% of the economy coming offline, it makes sense to use 12% number, so that gives you a number around 88 million barrels per day of demand. And don't forget that it's been an overproduction. So after a while, that oil in the storage tanks will have to get used up at some point. So it will, there is going to be a lag effect. So it's clear to say that global social, the, that the global situation of the adoption of social distancing has had 
of an effect on consumption, on oil consumption. The oil, so, the oil supply and demand curve really used to meet at 100 million, million barrels per day. It will probably go back there at some point. The question is when and what happens in the meantime. So let's look at the U.S. market summary. We had selling that was broad. It was swift. It was it, it really hit pretty much every sector. There was a few sector that did well. Think um, soap makers. Think um, gro uh, grocery companies. Um, some logistical companies, center of the aisle at Walmart or at Costco, those companies did well. Uh, everything else, correlation went to one. Market was down 34% in 23 days, much like most markets in, uh, around the world. So this pandemic um, affected everyone. Earnings consensus, again, just like in Canada, it's not complete. There's, but we need to do some extrapolation. So here, the S&P 500 earned last year in 2019 about around $150. So again, if you use the same metrics, six weeks of shutdown, and we're not taking advantage or taking into account here how quickly the, 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 the economy ramps up, or if there's pent up demand that will immediately be unleashed upon, uh, we really don't know that. And, and you know, talking heads on, on in the financial media are, taking both sides. At the end of the day, we just don't know. But let's, what we do know, the shutdown, four to, four to eight weeks, so let's call it six weeks. We shut it down for six weeks. The economy doesn't turn over. Um, 30, 40% of the economy is just not happening. And so therefore, I think it's safe to say that you take 10, 12% off that number and you get earnings of around 135. And that's really what I think will end up somewhere around there, $135. Dividends, in, in Europe, there's a lot of pressure to cut, cut dividends. In the U.S., it's not as pervasive in terms, uh, or even in Canada. Really, the, the, the dividend strategies are different in Europe than they are in North America. And a lot of the companies that do pay dividends in North America are in much better financial shape than they are in Europe. Um, debt levels, a lot of companies have tapped. And so that number will be skewed for a while because a lot of companies in this crisis that learned from 08 and 09 and actually tap their credit lines, not because they needed them, just they were worried that the banks would pull them. So by tapping them right away, they got the extra liquidity. Again, a lesson learned from past bear markets. So what do we do? So where does that leave us in terms of the market bottom? So we know that the market bottom technically was on the S&P 500, 2227, let's just call it 2250 for lack of a better word. So, or for simplicity's sake, I should say, so 2250. So what does that equate to fundamentally? Well, you need to take that number and divide it by, say, 130, 135. And that gives you an idea of how, um, how low the market can go. Obviously, the situation is fluid, but really it gives a pretty good indication of where the market lows uh, were hit. So we, we hit our 2227. Down here, market has rallied. We're now, as I said, closer to 2,700. The PE ratio historically has been anywhere between 16. Obviously, we have our earnings that are coming down, but our earnings here are um, going to be, the PE ratio, I should say, should be, let's just say, anywhere between 17 and 21 would be a number. So take your earnings, which will be, in my mind, on the low end, 135, multiply that by the P-E ratio of your choice, anywhere between 16 and um, even 15, if you want, 16 and 21. And that gives you an idea of where the market levels will be. Again, why is that important? Well, as you're deploying your capital, you want to do it uh, in the market. You want to do it in a down day, and it's very difficult to do it in a down day emotionally. So you want to sort of anchor, if you will, how low can the market go? And that's really how you get your numbers. Um, we've covered all of these technical things. So really the idea is to get your earnings and your multiples and, and, and really to get to give you an idea of where you think the market will go. Past quarter, I mean, it's in the past, but it's sort of indicative. So we had 19.6% uh, in US dollar terms in terms of returns. Um, we had a few sort of tech companies do well. Um, and pharmaceuticals, and as I said, center of the aisle, soap makers, that sort of thing. The energy sector is litters the, the worst performing stocks. In terms of sectors, we really had the wireless and the gold and the full retail. 
the rest of these companies really, there's no real data, so we'll ignore them for now, but you can see how broad the decimation. So if you're gonna get a market that goes down 19% in one quarter, you're gonna get a lot of these numbers. So department stores, oil and gas, we covered that, but hotels, um, casino and gaming, airlines, retailers, uh, retail mall owners, all of them have been absolutely crushed. Let's look at the foreign markets. So here we have four charts. The first one, we'll look at the currency. So we have the, uh, the Euro and the US dollar. We didn't have a lot of movement. We finished the quarter right here where we began the year right about here. And you can go back sort of to, to September. So the market is really in terms of its level, hasn't really changed that much the US dollar to the Euro, but we've had this massive volatility. Honestly, can't really explain it. So when in this market, when you can't explain something, you you use the, the, the excuse, not a lot of not a lot of players, markets are illiquid, so you get dislocations. At the end of the day, we just don't know what moved this market. Over here, we have our favorite uh, cross rate, the CAD and the US dollar. So the US dollar used to be, or the Canadian dollar was used, would peak really at 77 cents, and we fell down to 69 cents for every US dollar, finishing the quarter uh, slightly above 70 cents at 71. So a big drop here, it makes sense. Um, US economy, flight to quality. So a lot of people are, are flocking to the US uh, bond market as a measure of quality. Here we have the, um, the emerging markets. Just for indicative purposes here, we have 34% in the, in the, in the quarter, uh, very similar here in Europe. So really when I talk about correlation going to one, in a market downdraft, in a bear market, there's really no place to hide. If we look at the options market, um, obviously we see our VIX have peaked here, our VIX is still ele elevated right now as we speak, the, the, we're looking at somewhere around there. We can see previous peaks around 40, um, but really you can see the strategy I, I alluded to at the beginning of this uh, video around shorting VIX. So you can see that the VIX was very low uh, with no real spikes in 2017. We had a two spikes, but the rest of the year was quite low. And again, uh, we had a slightly larger range in the VIX, but still relatively subdued. The VIX, in my mind, anywhere between 10 and 20, really 15 and 20 is usually where historically it is. it, it, it will sit. Uh, 17 was just an odd year. We have here the interest rates, and I, I won't cover the interest rates uh, or the yield curve, carefully, but I just want to point out one specific issue with the yield curves, both here in um, in the US or here in Canada, I should say, and, and over in the US. So back in the fall, there was a lot of talk around negative yields, or negative yields curves, I should say. And so what we, with the chart that we have here is the difference between two-year bond rates and 20-year bond rates. And so we can see here back in August that this is the negative line. So they dip below in terms of the two and a tens in the US. In Canada, we've been negative for quite a long time, actually. Um, again, media talked about it here, but really the, the condition uh, lasted for a while. The reason why I'm bringing it up is because many pundits use an inverted yield curve, meaning short long rates are uh, lower than uh, short rates as a precursor for recession. So clearly we are in a recession and clearly we have, and we had in the US and we have currently uh, up until really the end of March, we had um, negative yields. But I don't think that there's any causality to these two situations. In other words, did the negative yields cause a recession? The upstream is it's a hard no. And so when people come out with you know recessions and, and clues and make regressions, it's important to understand, um, and it's while it's fresh in our minds, that um, while negative yields are always or negative yield curves are always associated with a recession, um, not every negative yield curve leads to a recession. In this case, it did, but it wasn't the cause of it, is I guess my point. Um, so what's the conclusion from our video? First of all, we are in a bear market. The economy and the central banks will determine the length of it. 
Bear markets usually have three stages historically. A big drop, a rally, which as the time of this video we're currently experiencing, and there's usually a second leg down. Now it's open for debate, and as time marches on and as the time of this video, central banks have done some Herculean efforts to try to mitigate uh, the down draft in all asset prices. So it remains to be seen whether we're gonna see the same type of retest, or are we gonna see it lower, or are we gonna see it later? Remember, this is a pandemic. So there's an economic story to this, but there's also um, a public health issue. So liquidity is really the first step to any good position for the next bull market. You wanna be able to upgrade your portfolio. You need to wanna be able to lean into the fear and deploy your capital. And finally, bear markets always end and they always give way to new bull markets. Remember that bull markets are scary. They're emotional. I mean, when the markets are coming off, you're, you're worried about losing your capital. And when markets rally up, you this fear of missing out takes over. Remember, fear and greed drive market and drive investors in the short term. Remember, bull markets always come around after bear markets. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, please drop us a line at info at exponent.com. We'd love to hear from you. If you want to hear further, if you would like us to make more videos, please let us know what topics, whether it's investing or financial planning. Thank you very much for watching and have a great day.